Starship is once again fully stacked and getting ready for its launch rehearsal, the Mercury probe hit a snag on its way to the planet, and we just had the most intense geomagnetic storm in the last 20 years, leaving us with tons of Aurora pictures! I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 17th of May, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. The Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury is in trouble. This week, the European Space Agency announced that its joint mission with the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency to the innermost planet in our solar system had hit a snag. The issue took place on April 26th, when the spacecraft was preparing for a maneuver to position itself for the first of three Mercury flybys set to take place in quick succession between September of this year and January of next year. The Bepi Colombo spacecraft is split into three modules, the Mercury Transfer Module, the Mercury Planetary Orbiter, and the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter. The transfer module is the one that's currently in charge to execute the large deep space maneuvers that are needed to arrive at Mercury. This module contained over one ton of xenon at launch and uses solar electric propulsion to effectively generate the huge amount of delta V needed to allow the rest of the spacecraft to come anywhere close to Mercury. Well, these thrusters are currently the ones that are suffering the issue on Bepi Colombo. During its update, ESA said that during the maneuver on April 26th, the transfer module failed to deliver enough power to the spacecraft's thrusters. Over a few days, teams tried to work out this issue and fortunately were able to restore the thrust of the spacecraft to 90% of its previous level. While this is close to what it was before, it's still not full thrust and teams are still evaluating what the long-lasting effect of this might be. Bepi Colombo is still on track to perform the first of the three upcoming Mercury flybys, but ESA didn't say what impacts this issue will have on the other two. You know, it's actually really hard to travel into the inner solar system, which is why Bepi Colombo had to perform an Earth flyby, two Venus flybys, and, under nominal conditions, it was supposed to execute a total of six Mercury flybys. These flybys allow the spacecraft to take advantage of the gravitational pull of the planets to change its trajectory and to save fuel while still carrying a meaningful amount of payload into Mercury's orbit. Under nominal conditions, Bepi Colombo was expected to separate its transfer module in December of next year for an orbital insertion around Mercury using the chemical thrusters on the Mercury Planetary Orbiter. These are better suited for that kind of maneuver as they're higher thrust, but it's still unknown what Bepi Colombo's future will look like. It wouldn't be surprising if, due to the thruster issues on the transfer module, ESA and JAXA decide to change the trajectory and the goals for this mission to perform more flybys before arriving at Mercury. But what's definitely for sure is that the teams will try to come up with a new plan one way or another. The Sun is currently in the most active part of its solar cycle, near what's known as Solar Maximum. And nearly everyone on planet Earth got a glowing reminder of this last week when auroras were seen at far lower latitudes than they're normally seen. It all began when a giant group of sunspots, known as AR3664, showed up on the Sun's surface and rotated into position to fire X-class solar flares and coronal mass ejections at Earth. This group had somewhere in the order of 85 sunspots, and a similar appearance to one that showed up at the time of the Carrington event in 1859. The Carrington event was the strongest geomagnetic storm in recorded history, and it was named after British astronomer Richard Christopher Carrington, who documented the solar flare that was associated with the event. Thankfully, this event was nowhere near as strong as Carrington, but it did produce auroras in all 50 U.S. states. Yes, even Hawaii, and in many other places of the world also that don't normally get the northern or southern lights. This event was comparable in strength to the 1989 or the 2003 solar storms that knocked out power to certain northerly regions like around Quebec and in Sweden, but that didn't happen this time around. Power grids were well prepared for the event, and precautionary measures were taken well ahead of the arrival of the storm. Many photographers, including some of NSF's own, got excellent aurora pictures from places pretty far south, like Cape Canaveral and Texas. Of course, this also meant that further north, like in Ontario, the aurora lights were a lot more impressive than usual. Our very own Ryan Caton was also able to observe the aurora from the UK as well, and many places in Europe essentially turned pink from all the lights of the aurora. In the Southern Hemisphere, people were able to see the aurora much further north than usual, and observers in New Zealand and Australia also got a chance to see the spectacle as well. The giant sunspot group has now rotated away from a position where it can affect Earth, but the sun isn't done yet, as we are near the height of the 12-year solar cycle. 
On May 14th, right before turning away from Earth, this region emitted an X8.7 flare, the most powerful yet of this solar cycle. This flare was even more powerful than the X5.8 flare that erupted on May 10th, which was part of the series of X-class flares that caused all of this aurora fun and the accompanying high-frequency radio outages and communications disruptions. The emerging satellite constellations in low and medium Earth orbit, along with communications and power infrastructure, appeared to make it through the storm relatively unscathed. In fact, Elon Musk and other SpaceX officials have confirmed that all of Starlink satellites made it through the solar storm without losing any of its members. This stands in stark contrast to a situation in 2022 where most of the satellites deployed during a specific mission were lost due to a geomagnetic storm just the day after their launch. During the two days of peak activity, the GPS system suffered irregularities but returned to normal shortly thereafter. NASA also confirmed that the crew of the ISS remained safe throughout the geomagnetic storm and no special measures had to be taken. Although this geomagnetic storm didn't greatly affect Earth, our planet's electrical power and communications infrastructure need to be on alert for future solar eruptions. The most powerful solar flare in modern recorded history was an X-45 flare in 2003, and the 1859 Carrington event, even more powerful, caused telegraph wires to spark. If we aren't prepared or vigilant, a repeat of the Carrington event could cause trillions of dollars worth of damage and potentially harm satellites and even people in space, something to take into consideration as we return humans to the moon later in the decade. The stack is back. Just over two months since Starship's last flight, another Starship stack is back on the pad at Starbase. Of course, whenever we have a full stack Starship at Starbase, it's not for nothing. It usually means that testing is about to happen. And indeed, this Thursday, we got our first taste of full stack testing with a partial tanking test of Ship 29 and Booster 11 at the orbital launch pad. The test was the first using the recently installed horizontal liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen tanks on the orbital tank farm. These now completely replace the large vertical tanks that were originally installed for the orbital pad. Those tanks are now being removed and scrapped one by one. In fact, you can see on the footage from yesterday's tanking test that the SpaceX-branded LR-11000 crane at the pad was holding onto a shell of one of those tanks as it was in the process of dismantling it. With this partial tanking test now in the bag, SpaceX will likely set up for a full wet dress rehearsal in the coming days, something that will allow the company to further test the tank farm and the sequencing of events ahead of launch. Starbase General Manager Kathy Leaders recently talked about this test taking place in the next week, and there are marine notices that indicate such a thing could happen as soon as this Saturday, May 18th. She also indicated in her talk that SpaceX is currently aiming for late May or early June for the next launch of Starship, and that, most likely, both the FAA and SpaceX will end up being ready at around the same time. One with the mission paperwork and the other one with the rocket hardware, of course. Despite this, we still don't know yet where either of them are in the paperwork process. We also don't know what else is going to be new on this flight, other than that SpaceX is hoping that this time, the ship makes it through re-entry. In general, we really don't know much about the status of the mission, other than the launch period that SpaceX is aiming for, and that a wet dress rehearsal is coming soon. After that rehearsal, though, we're probably going to see a D-stack of Ship 29, and perhaps even a rollback to the production site. You might have noticed that the ship is still missing some tiles, and in close-up views, we can see other tiles that are marked as not okay and therefore need to be replaced. We'll definitely talk a lot about this on our upcoming Starbase update episode next week. So be on the lookout for that, as it'll feature a Starbase flyover that our photographers Jack and Mary took recently, and that'll include some interesting views of the upcoming second orbital launch pad. Now, all of this heat shield work is worth noting. SpaceX is really trying to get this heat shield right before flight so that Ship 29 can survive re-entry. We should expect a lot of the remaining work ahead of flight to be pretty much all about the heat shield. So here's hoping that we do get to see that hot and spicy re-entry really soon. But in the meantime, you can get our brand new Starship Flight 4 patch, which also features the ship's re-entry. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. NASA's Europa Clipper spacecraft is ready to ship to the Kennedy Space Center. This is just another step in a long list that the flagship mission needs to complete in order to reach the largest of the planets in our solar system. The spacecraft completed all pre-launch testing in March, and since then, teams have been preparing it for the shipment to the launch site. 
Last month, our very own Jack Byer was able to visit the clean room on the last opportunity for the media to visit Europa Clipper in person. Once at the Kennedy Space Center, the spacecraft will be equipped with its main antenna and solar arrays, which are so large that they had to be transported separately. Not long after shipment, Europa Clipper will be integrated with its Falcon Heavy rocket, with the launch still on track to take place no earlier than October 10th. Rocket Factory Augsburg has completed a major milestone in its preparations to fly its RFA-1 rocket. This week, the company test-fired the rocket's first stage on their test stand turned launch pad at Saxevoort in the Shetland Islands. The first stage had been transported to the launch site just a few weeks ago and has since been prepared for a series of incremental tests that will eventually culminate in a launch later this year. This first hot fire test was conducted by firing only four engines on the first stage, but it's expected that subsequent tests will become progressively more complex until finally completing a full stack test prior to the rocket's liftoff. Here's hoping we get to see that soon. The exploration company aims to develop and build European cargo and crew spacecraft later in the decade, and for that, it's preparing for subscale missions in the next year or so. This week, we got news that it completed closing out its Mission Possible capsule prototype set to launch next year. This prototype will allow the company to move on to the Nix spacecraft soon thereafter, which will start by flying cargo and then later crew. The company has already applied for the Commercial European Cargo Program, and it's contracted to supply the Axiom space station once it's up in orbit. Nix will eventually have three variants, one for low Earth orbit, one for lunar orbit, and another variant made to land on the moon. Nix is also being developed to be modular, reusable, and refillable in orbit. To accomplish these huge goals, this week we saw more progress from the company towards that end. The startup just recently hired former NASA Deputy Associate Administrator for Artemis Campaign Development and Orion Program Manager Mark Kirisich to lead the company's U.S. subsidiary in Houston. Kirisich was also Blue Origin's Senior Director of Human Spaceflight, so he'll definitely be able to add a lot of that experience to the exploration company. Space Pioneer is making progress on the debut of its partially reusable Tianlong-3 rocket. The company recently shipped the first stage of this rocket to the launch site, and it's preparing to conduct a hot fire test of it very soon. While the company had wanted this test to take place in May, it's had to reschedule the hot fire test for June, and the maiden flight of the Tianlong-3 rocket has now been pushed later into the summer as well. It's not clear whether Space Pioneer will try to recover the first stage for this debut flight, but eventually the first stage of this rocket should be reusable, just like a Falcon 9. Despite the recent delays, Space Pioneer continues to make progress for this debut flight. This week, the company shared videos and pictures of the most recent separation test of the fairing halves for Tianlong-3. This checks off another item on the list of milestones that are needed to be completed for this mission, so we'll have to wait and see how things continue for Space Pioneer in the next few weeks and months. Now let's go over all of the traffic in space during the past week and see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off the week, we had the first launch of the Chongzheng 4C rocket this year on May 11th at 2343 UTC from South Launch Site 2 at the Zhouchuan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying the Xi'an 23 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. Not much has been officially said about this satellite, other than that it's a technology demonstrator satellite for space environment detection. That's another way of saying this satellite is meant to look at other satellites. It wouldn't be a week without more Starlink launches. The first of two this week took off from Florida, with the Falcon 9 launching on May 13th at 53 minutes past midnight UTC. The mission, Starlink Group 658, was carrying another batch of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B1073, was flying for a 15th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, A Shortfall of Gravitas. This was once again the fastest turnaround time for this drone ship, supporting two landings back-to-back -back within four days of each other. The other East Coast drone ship, Just Read the Instructions, is currently undergoing some quick dry dock maintenance at NASA before joining the fleet again. The second Starlink launch of the week took place from Vandenberg, this time carrying Starlink direct to self satellites. Liftoff of the Starlink Group 87 mission took place on May 14th at 1839 UTC, and on board there were seven Starlink V2 mini satellites and 13 Starlink direct to self satellites, all going into low Earth orbit. The booster for this mission, B1063, was flying for an 18th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. This was SpaceX's 50th launch of the year, putting the company on track to complete about 135 Falcon launches by the end of 2024. 
The fourth and last launch of the week took place just yesterday night from Russia. A Soyuz 2.1B rocket lifted off on May 16th at 2121 UTC from the Plisets Cosmodrome, carrying a secretive Russian military payload. No information has been published yet about the purpose of this mission, other than that it was carrying multiple satellites for the Russian Ministry of Defense. The first launch going into next week will be later tonight from Florida with, you guessed it, another Starlink mission. This one will see the return of Booster B-1062, which will become the booster with the most flights in the Falcon fleet at 21 flights. The first launch opportunity for this mission would be May 18th at 32 minutes past midnight UTC. From the other side of the US, SpaceX will launch another Falcon 9, and while technically it won't be a Starlink mission, it may very well be carrying Star Shield satellites as it's the first launch of the National Reconnaissance Office's proliferated space architecture constellation. The four-hour launch window was set to open on May 19th at 7.22 UTC. Next week, Blue Origin will also return to crewed flights with its new Shepard rocket and capsule system. The company had announced the crew just about a month ago, and this week, Blue announced that it's targeting this mission to launch on May 19th with a window opening at 1330 UTC. After a scrub last week during the launch countdown, NASA and Boeing were targeting the launch of Starliner's first crewed mission for later today, but that won't happen. Both NASA and Boeing announced earlier this week that the launch is slipping a few more days so that they can investigate a small helium leak that was detected on the Starliner service module. Teams have been trying to solve this issue and understand the root cause of it, so don't be surprised if the mission slips just a bit more to ensure that everything is okay. For now, we'll be here to cover it when it happens. From the other side of the world in New Zealand, we'll have the launch of an Electron on a mission dubbed Ready Aim Prefire, carrying the first of two Prefire CubeSats for NASA. The one hour launch window is set to open on May 22nd at 7.15 UTC. And wrapping up next week, we'll have the launch of another Falcon 9 rocket with the Starlink Group 662 mission taking place from Florida. The four hour launch window is set to open on May 23rd at 2245 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.